Hi! Large language models or short LLMs are powerful but often slow at inference. So today we discuss this new method that takes a pre-trained transformer LLM and during inference it makes it faster and use less memory with sparsity. And sparsity means that the transformer only uses a fraction of its neurons and attention heads on each input. And this method that makes sparsity work at inference is introduced in the déjà vu paper. It is not easy to make an LLM sparse only after training, so at inference, but if you watch this video you will learn why it is hard. Also in this video you will learn that the methods are actually quite elegant and simple, but you will also learn about other nuggets of insight about LLMs and transformer that the déjà vu paper contains, namely how attention works and what it does to its inputs and why MLP layers in transformers usually have sparse outputs. This is quite a technical video towards the end, so if you want to refresh your knowledge about the transformer, please watch our latest video explaining all transformer components such as attention and the MLPs. Now let's dive into the déjà vu paper in this AI coffee break. Transformer-based LLMs are slow at inference time. This directly affects the speed at which your favorite chatbot responds to you. Have you ever wondered what goes under the hood when you ask a digital assistant a question and why they need time to respond? Well, it's because they do a lot of computations given an input. They pass it through the self-attention layer, which scales quadratically with sequence length and consists of multiple attention heads. Watch our last video if you need a refresher on transformers. Then the input passes through the MLP layer, which is a feed-forward network of usually a layer doubling the size of the input embedding and then reducing it back to the size of the input embedding. And that was just one transformer layer. The process repeats depending on how many layers the LLM has, which could be 6 or 12 or 48 or 1000. Larger models with more layers can be more powerful because they have more time to transform the inputs and shape them into the right answer. But more layers are more demanding in terms of computations, and furthermore, LLMs also spend significant time loading all parameters into the memory of your device. Imagine you have a transformer-based app on your phone, which you open, type in a query, get your answer and quit the app. You would quickly become frustrated if the app needed to load for a long time when you're just wanting to quickly ask it something. So how can we make these powerful tools more efficient and user-friendly? This is where the innovations of the Deja Vu paper come in. They aim to reduce this loading time significantly by making the LLM sparse, meaning that Deja Vu reduces the number of parameters one needs to load and activate. But the idea of sparse neural networks where only a small fraction of the model parameters activate, such as 5% or 10%, goes back to 1989. In theory, sparsity could save up all the computations that the turned off neurons do not have to do anymore. And also it would speed up the loading time of the model since you do not need to load all the unused weights. But the problem with modern hardware, such as the GPUs on which we usually run LLMs, is that they are optimized for dense networks whose layers are described by dense matrices without a lot of zeros. Sparse networks are described by sparse matrices with a lot of zeros in them, and since GPUs are not optimized for sparse matrix multiplications, sparsifying the network does not actually give us the speed up we'd expect. Also, to make a sparse neural network run accurately, one needs to train it this way, to prepare it, so to say, for the fact that some components will turn off at inference time. And since most LLMs are dense, one would need expensive retraining to sparsify them. Another problem arises when sparsity takes a static pattern. It turns out that if LLMs are using static sparsity, meaning that we turn off neurons independently of the input, they lose their ability to perform in context learning, which is not unexpected since in context learning is all about attending to user given examples in the input and turning off attention heads and neurons independently on the input might ruin the LLM's attention to the examples given by the user. 
Therefore, the idea of the déjà vu paper is to turn off neurons and attention heads depending on the input, which the authors call contextual sparsity. Contextual sparsity means that we dynamically decide which parts to be used on the specific current input, much like how your brain only activates certain parts when solving different types of problems. To figure out which neurons and attention heads to use and which ones to turn off, déjà vu employs simpler neural networks. The déjà vu authors do the theoretical work to motivate contextual sparsity and also do empirical analysis. From the list of authors you maybe know Tri Dao for his influential work on flash attention or Mamba, and flash attention has been widely adopted very fast after release. With Tri Dao contributing to the paper, you can be sure that déjà vu is all about making transformers work faster. To understand how many of the attention heads and how many neurons in the MLP layers can be deleted without ruining performance, the authors conducted an experiment using the OpenBook QA and Wikitext datasets. The authors take input examples from those datasets and ran them through OPT of various sizes of 30 billion, 66 and 175 billion parameters. They recorded which attention heads and which MLP neurons had outputs with large norm. So large magnitudes, large outputs. Then with the same input, they ran the LLM again, but turned off 80% of the attention heads with smallest norm and 95% of the MLP neurons with smallest norm as well. They saw that on average the performance did not degrade and this suggests that a large part of the model may not be essential for the overall functionality, which paves the way for developing déjà vu to cut off unneeded components. So for déjà vu they use the recorded pairs of input and large versus small norms and trained for each MLP layer a simple fully connected neural network with two layers to classify which of the MLP neurons has large norm. They also trained the same MLP architecture for each attention layer to predict which of the attention heads has high norm. Then to sparsify the LLM for any inputs, they let it run only with the neurons and attention heads predicted by the small neural networks. But how does it come that the time these small sparsity predictor networks need to run their decision does not exceed the time the layer would have done that computation in the first place? Well, it's because the authors executed the sparsity prediction for the MLP while the attention layers were still computing their outputs in parallel. And they implemented déjà vu mostly in Python with a necessary implementation of hardware-aware sparse matrix multiplication because remember, GPUs are fast for a dense matrix multiplication and they needed this additional programming to make sparse matrix multiplication fast as well. And the whole work paid off, since the authors could reduce the runtime cost of OPT 175 billion. A 75% sparse version of OPT maintains the same accuracy as the dense OPT on language modeling on Wikitext and C4, and only after 75% sparsity performance degraded, so perplexity increased. It was also successful on downstream tasks datasets, and Deja Vu was two times faster than the faster transformer implementation from NVIDIA, which is written entirely in C++ and CUDA, and it was six times faster than the most popular transformer implementation in Hugging Face. And this is great news when trying to make LLMs run in real time. While the authors only apply Deja Vu to LLMs, I see no reason why it would not work for vision transformers as well, or for transformers working with other modalities. Also, it is noticeable how Deja Vu is in spirit a kind of a mixture of experts, or short MOE architecture. MOE does the following at each layer. It uses a neural network layer after the attention layer to tell which MLP layer to use from a series of many MLP layers. Deja Vu, on the other hand, decides with small neural networks to which neurons from the MLP layer and to which attention heads to route the input to. So Deja Vu works on neuron and attention level and at inference time, while MOE already applies during training and works at the coarser level of choosing between MLP variants. So this was the method, but the paper still has 
theoretical insights to offer. Did you wonder why one can get away with using just 20% of attention heads with the highest norm and just 5% of MLP neurons with highest norm without losing performance? Well, the authors point out that contextual sparsity in MLPs comes because the ReLU or gel activation functions set all negative activations to zero anyway. Furthermore, the authors empirically observe that the cosine similarity is high between representations from one layer to the next, meaning that activations from layer to layer do not change a lot. This is because there is a residual connection around the attention block and one around the MLP block. Each layer learns to add only a small norm, in comparison, the norm of the residual connection is large. But why is the norm of the layer small while the norm of the residual is high? Well, because most of the vector values of the activations in the MLP are zero because of ReLU and GELU activations. But why does contextual sparsity exist also for attention? Well, we have known from previous research on attention head pruning that one can get rid of the same attention heads for all input samples because some attention heads turn out to be useless on average. But contextual sparsity is different because it means that some inputs need some attention heads, while other inputs need other attention heads, while static pruning was all about turning off the same attention head for all inputs. When trying to understand contextual sparsity in attention blocks, the authors see that there are heads with uniform attention scores and heavy hitter heads, with high attention values on thumb tokens. They observe how it is important to keep the heavy hitter heads since they are responsible for the interesting token interactions. But why are the heavy hitters modeling interesting interactions and the uniform ones don't? Well, the explanation is kind of lengthy, so uh, sit down. It's because attention might be performing something similar to mean shift clustering. Ms. Kopfibin, <laughs> what is mean shift clustering? Well, mean shift clustering works by computing centroids for each cluster. It starts with random centroids and updates the centroids for each cluster by calculating the mean of the points lying in a certain region. And the mean is adding the points and dividing by how many they are. And attention does something similar. There we add the value vectors weighted by how similar their query and key was. So here in attention we add value vectors, just like in mean shift clustering, we add data points to compute the mean, so the centroid. The denser a region, the more data points contribute to that mean, which is similar to high attention scores that make a certain input token contribute a lot. So in mean shift clustering, dense regions get richer, and similarly in attention, similar tokens get more similar and get higher and higher attention scores and form these heavy hitters. In summary, each self-attention head does one mean shift clustering step to push input embeddings of tokens together and we get heavy hitter attention heads. Wow, you made it until this very end of the explanation. Thanks for watching and let us know in the comments what you think. If you want to see more videos like this, do not forget to like and subscribe. Okay, bye.